sense in the meditation that uh, I wanted to look a little bit more closely today at the Buddha's teaching on non-self and on the areas of existence that he discussed as being non-self but the same areas that uh, he pointed out as not belonging to oneself are precisely the areas where we cling <laughs> right. so I don't know how well versed a lot of you are with these teachings but I thought it would be good to bring it up and just to go straight to the Buddha's words on these things because sometimes it can be challenging but it's also very profound and I think it's a great leveler because the Buddha talks always about our existence in terms of five components and all of us have these so you know sometimes we start to cling to things like oh I wish I didn't have this restless mind or I wish that maybe I could always be kind to people even when I'm tired or you know and after a while you start to notice that ah whatever is happening in our body or mind always falls into one of these categories and the bits that we don't like or we react to are usually because we're identifying with our experience right so it's this sense of self that comes in and says this isn't right you know I shouldn't be like this I want this to go away yeah, other people aren't like this. So this is all because we take these experiences as belonging to ourself. And not only belonging to ourself, but they mean something about me. You know, this being in here, it means something about me. Yeah. Even if, say, I, I do well at school or I don't do well, you know, <coughs> in my job, that means something about my intrinsic value and worth. And actually these things are conditioned. So one of the main principles of the teaching of non-self is that not that there's nothing there at all because there is something there and the Buddha says you know you can't say there's nothing because the arising of phenomena is seen but you can't say that there's uh, something really inherent and, and solid eternal etc because passing away is seen so rather he talks about experience as something that's conditioned something that has a cause and from that cause it yields an effect Right? So if you like, all of us here are products of our conditioning. You know, If I would have had your life, I would speak Polish, I would have the same genes, I would probably look like you. <laughs> you know, I might have similar qualities <coughs> or characteristics, and if I've been through the same challenges that you might have been through, then perhaps I would turn out just the same. So there's nothing particularly Anna-ish about this experience, it's just that, you know, through certain things that have happened in your life this is the product and it's not a final product it's something in process I mean I'm sure most of us can look back to ourselves as children and you know and see sort of like a blueprint for how we became later perhaps but also ways in which we could have developed differently or maybe would have done given different circumstances or maybe you can see something that was similar but it was kind of evolving you know like when I was small I was quite shy I was very shy actually to the point where I wouldn't uh, want to answer any questions in class, you know, and if I did, I'd go bright red. So my best friend was the same, so we always used to really avoid that. And later on in my life, I could also see that this was a tendency in a group situation because I simply hadn't had that kind of experience. I'd avoided it, you know. But then I also saw how it became an issue if I started to identify myself, therefore, as a shy person or somebody who blushed when they shouldn't blush you know and that meant something about me like that I couldn't then teach the Dhamma for example or I couldn't show up in public or you know be am among strangers I always had to be with my best friend rather than with a group so you could see how this becomes a fixed idea and I had to challenge that in order to feel able to serve in different ways and always when we're challenged to do something that's outside of our comfort zone we have to let go of certain perceptions or fixed ideas of who we think we are and just say okay let's see what this situation yields for me like what are the challenges <coughs> what are the potentialities for growth and I think I can see various ways in which I've grown recently which are maybe not the ways I'd have chosen or maybe not the things I thought were most important what I thought was more important was to meditate 24 hours a day if possible at least 22 or you know at least when I'm awake okay <laughs> but instead you know I'm developing in a sense of service and sometimes meeting my edge and not particularly liking that edge but going beyond it nevertheless you know or another way I may be developing is in a sense of confidence which comes from just the wish to benefit others 
so I can let go of some of those limiting self ideas and just let them go into the flow and say okay I'll transform that energy instead into something that I'm giving you know so it's almost like you can step aside a little bit or leave a little bit of space around that and let something else come through and so different qualities are developing than maybe would have done in a different situation you know if I'd be in Burma now I'd probably look quite different too I'd be thinner I was a lot thinner you know, I may have different health issues, perhaps my stomach would be worse, perhaps some other health issues would have been avoided. We don't know, you know, but what we can say from this is that none of these things, whether the body or our feelings, yeah, our perceptions, the way we respond to life, the way we react to life, or even the way we are aware of phenomena, none of these things are fixed and none of them are kind of immutable or permanent. They're always in a flow. They're always in a flow, and they play out differently. They, you know, you might have different permutations of these things arising at any one time. So, with that little introduction, I have like slipped in quite a lot of Buddhist terminology without actually labelling uh, what I'm talking about. But we're going to go straight to um, a sutta from the Samyutta Nikaya, which is called the uh, collection on connected uh, topics, if you like. And this is called the Kanda Samyutta. It's in a huge book, but it's not really scary. <laughs> Once you start to get into it, it's actually wonderful because you'll find that one word that the Buddha coins has a huge meaning and it's very hard to translate into English. There's so much nuance in that. Um, but it's succinct enough that it gives us a kind of formula so that we have something at hand that we can immediately um, help to make sense of our experience. So rather than getting to really complicated stories about our psychology, we can say, oh yeah, that's perception, you know, or that's um, pleasant feeling and I'm reacting with liking, or that's unpleasant feeling and I'm reacting with aversion, you know, it can be that simple. And uh, when we come down to that point, we immediately get a little bit of space between those phenomena and ourselves, yeah. So this may be challenging and it's kind of meant to be, so I'm hoping it is. Um, but we won't get probably through that much of it. I've done a couple of readings of this at, at the Vihara in Oxford and we've only managed to get through the first paragraph the first time because we ended up explaining what the terminology meant. But it was very rich because these things have to mean something to us. You know, There's no use just having them as like technical terms. We have to understand what they actually mean, how they manifest and how we can kind of make use of them in our life, yeah? So it doesn't matter how far we get, but I wanted to uh, just read the words of the Buddha and we can have, we'll try and minimize comments along the way, but if you have questions that would help you, you know, if there's anything you really don't understand, please just ask and I'll quickly, um, hopefully try and clear that up, yeah? Okay. So this sutta was actually um, the second sermon that the Buddha ever gave after he became fully enlightened under the Bodhi tree. And I don't know if you've heard of the first sutta that he gave, it was mostly around the Four Noble Truths. So it was about the suffering, the truth of suffering, yeah? that there is suffering and what that means, and that there's a cause of that suffering. Because there's a cause, there's also a way out of suffering, yeah? which is the opposite of cause. So the cause was clinging, the way out was letting go, giving, giving away, and then a path. And that path is called the Eightfold Path. So that's what we practice as Buddhists. And in that um, particular discourse, one person became partially enlightened. Like they saw the truth of suffering and they saw that suffering can end. And this was the first time, if you like, that the Buddha knew for sure that what he'd experienced could be transmitted. In other words, his own wisdom didn't enable only himself to become enlightened, but he was able to actually teach others, and it worked. You could actually be taught. You know, Imagine if it was just a one-off thing that happened to somebody, but there was no way to actually convey that to anybody else. Mm. We wouldn't yes. be here, you know. Mm. Our friendships wouldn't exist. We wouldn't even know each other. We wouldn't be sitting here discussing it. But because it was such a universal understanding and realisation, and the Buddha was such a genius that he was able to articulate and encapsulate it in very succinct formulations that people could understand. It could actually be conveyed to others. So to me, the place that that happened, which was Varanasi in the deer park, 
is one of the most important pilgrimage sites. There's the place of enlightenment, there's the place of his Parinibbana where he attained complete peace. I know that a lot of people think the place he was enlightened was the most important. My teacher feels that the place he actually left this world was the most important. I beg to differ and I feel that the place he taught was the most important because that was when we realised from one Buddha we can get many, many enlightened beings. We can, you know, his freedom enables us to find our own freedom because the mind is the mind and it works the same way for all. So it's because of this that, you know, we, we, we have the Dhamma, we have a chance to understand how to live a beautiful life and how to find peace within and give peace to others. So this was the first sermon and then the second one he ever gave was this one that we're going to read and this was also given in the same place and the result of this one was that all five of his first uh, disciples became fully enlightened because they saw through all the areas which they previously identified as a self or as something belonging to them, you know, something they had control over. They could see that all these things were conditioned. There were phenomena, if you like, that arise and that pass away. And once you see that, there's no more clinging. Why cling to something that's coming and going? It's like if you go outside and you see a beautiful butterfly. It's beautiful because it's free. It's beautiful because it flutters, it comes and it goes. If it was just stable, it was always there, right in front of your face. You know? mm. <laughs> it wouldn't really be very magical at all. But it's a phenomena, it's a piece of nature. We can't control that, we can't capture it. You know what it's like when you see animals or humans, sadly, captured and put behind bars. You know, all that life disappears because they're not free anymore. So this is nature and we try to kind of you know, control it and we, we put on so many limitations and we do it internally too. You know, we say, oh, this is my thought, I don't want this thought, I shouldn't be thinking like this after all these years of meditation or after listening to that Dhamma talk last week, I should know better. But the thing is that thought just arises because of conditions. And if we can just see that and understand that, then we already reduce a lot of suffering, a lot of suffering, and we give it some space. We give it space. When it has space, it can move into that space. It can pass away from that space. It's not stuck in this small little narrow confine. So we won't get very far unless I start to read. So this is called the Anatta Lakana Sutta. That means the characteristic, if you like, of non-self. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Baranasi, that's Baranasi, in the deer park at Isipatana, that's modern day Sarnath. There, the Blessed One, who is the Buddha, addressed the bhikkhus of the group of five thus. So these bhikkhus were his friends, his uh, monastic friends at this point. And uh, normally in the suttas, when it talks about the monks, it usually includes the nuns as well, and also the lay people. But in this case, there were only five. <laughs> so I guess we can allow <laughs> the, the fact that it was addressed to the monks. So the bhikkhus replied, Venerable Sir! And then the Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, form is non-self. Okay, so first of all we've got a, a term here, form. So in this case form actually means anything material, so anything like that which is physical, which is uh, formed if you want, but it means materiality. Yeah. So form in this case, the Buddha's teaching them to look inward so he's really referring to the body yeah so you could say the body so form is non-self and then he reasons why for if because form were self this form would not lead to affliction and it would be possible to have it of form let my form be thus let my form not be thus but because form is non-self Form leads to affliction, or if you like, to suffering, yeah? And it is not possible to have it a form. Let my form be thus, let my form not be thus. So already we're seeing two main principles coming out here. So the fact that it doesn't belong to us is the reason we can't control it. We can't actually say, I want my body to be this way or that way, because it's easy, pretty easy to see, first of all, that we have our genetic makeup. So within that, you know, there may be some things we can do. I hear nowadays people do eyebrow threading, which is really weird. 
Sorry if anybody's done it, but yeah. Anyway, we seem to think that you know blokes who might be interested might go, "Whoa, look at her eyebrows! That's really nice." <laughs> but probably they don't. So you know, you can modify your eyebrows if you want to, but they'll still grow back anyway if you leave them for a bit. So you know, you you can kind of have, mm, you can have the delusion of control if you want. But how much can you really control the body? You know, does it really stay healthy just when you want it to, or does it get sick just before you've got a long journey to make? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's doing this all the time. So this is one thing, and so we would have control, and it would not lead to affliction, right? Because if it was ours, we could say, okay, behave yourself, like feel this way, don't feel that way. Yeah, stomach, stop being acidic. You know, I took my medicines. You should know better I didn't even have strong tea and my stomach turned acidic but unfortunately it's not oneself actually inflammation is a good one to see that because it's very erratic and it just comes up when it comes up and sometimes you can eat perfectly well and it's you still get an inflamed stomach <laughs> so the Buddha here is concerned with uh, the fact that it leads to affliction or leads to suffering yeah and again it's part of the main thrust of his teachings that he's trying to turn us away from things that lead to suffering so is that is there any questions about that little paragraph first of all or anything that seems unclear or would you like me to read that again yeah so bhikkhus form is non-self for if bhikkhus form were self this form would not lead to affliction and it would be possible to have it a form. Let my form be thus. In other words, let it be this way. Let my form not be thus. But because form is non-self, form leads to affliction, and it is not possible to have it a form. Let my form be thus. Let my form not be thus. So then he goes through the four other areas we identify with or we take as part of who we think we are, yeah, or what makes us a self, a person, a permanent essence. So one is the material body, and I think that's the easiest one to see through, you know, because we can see that this body's changing all the time against all our will, and, you know. I mean, for example, if you go for an operation and say you have to have your arm removed or something like that, so is that arm you, or is the rest of your body you? Like, which part of your body is you at that point? You know. Or sometimes somebody's an amputee, right? They have to have all their limbs removed. Mm -hmm. So which part is them? Which part is not? Is any of it? Is any of the body yeah. really them? You know, what what remains behind that's their the essence? It's the mind. It's well, so. you can say it's the mind, but let's go further, because I think most of us do feel that it's our mind. Yeah. yeah. But is our mind always the same? Does the mind change? Does it do what we want? Take care. So, I'll read the next little paragraph. Bhikkhus, feeling is non-self. For if bhikkhus feeling were self, this feeling would not lead to affliction, and it would be possible to have it a feeling. Let my feeling be thus. Let my feeling not be thus. But because feeling is non-self, Feeling leads to affliction, and it is not possible to have it a feeling. Let my feeling be thus. Let my feeling not be thus. Okay? So feeling is often something we get very you know, wrapped up in. It's like, I feel such and such. I feel you know, really sick, or I feel really, really happy. You know? And it's, it's an I that feels. And I think what the Buddha is trying to point to here is that feeling is there, but there's not necessarily a, a person who feels. So we can start to maybe change the way we think about it rather than saying, I feel happy. We could maybe say, happiness is there. You know, happiness is there. Happiness is arising. But happiness passes away too. So if feeling is self, then what happens when the happiness passes away? Were you that happiness? Now it's gone. Who are you? Or maybe we identify with our suffering, especially perhaps grief. You know, some people are very 
stuck in a particular emotion, especially if something very traumatic's happened. And they don't know who they'd be without that grief. Mm -hmm. And when that grief's gone, then who are they? Was that grief ever them? You know, but we say, I am grieving, or I am this, I am that. So in this way, we stick to these things, or we make them ours. Yeah. And the Buddha's saying that they're not ours. Mm. So the other places that the Buddha talks about, so the next one is perception. So he says, bhikkhus, perception is non-self. For if bhikkhus, perception were self, this perception would not lead to suffering, and it would be possible to have it of perception. Let my perception be st thus. Let my perception not be thus. But because perception is non-self, perception leads to suffering or affliction, and it is not possible to have it of perception. Let my perception be thus. Let my perception not be thus. So we can see how our perception changes constantly. Yeah. One day you think you're in not a very good mood and you think of that person you live with in quite a negative way and you perceive all their faults. Mm -hmm. The next day you're in a much better mood and oh, they're not so bad at all, you know. In fact, maybe they're really caring, they just put it a bit, you know, mm -hmm. not very skillfully or, you know, you see all the, all mm -hmm. the good things. And the other thing about perception, you can even see the past totally differently depending on your present state of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, you look upon it as a chain of terrible events that got you into the mess you're in now. Whereas when you're, you know, doing quite well, you feel really contented, you've just had a picnic in the forest with the bluebells or whatever, everything seems so sweet. And then you look on the past and you think, you remember all the other times you were in the nature with your friends and so many beautiful things that happened in your life and how even the difficult times passed away, you know, and all brought you to this moment now. So perception is coloured by our experience, past, present and future. So are we our perception? You know, do we always perceive things the same way or is that also conditioned? So this is the idea, right? The Buddha's again, he's not saying there's no nothing happening, like there's no thing at all. Right? He's just saying that perception is not what we think it is. It's not ours, it's not a self, it is rather conditioned, it's a phenomena, it's a conditioned phenomena. Yeah. So, and then the next one is about something called Sankara, and this is harder to translate into English, but um, the way I would explain it is that it's another aspect of the mind, all these are aspects of the mind, okay, feeling, perception, Sankara, and the last one is consciousness. So these are the four different as different um, components, if you like, of the mind. So the Buddha is saying that these are all that are really there. So you you feel, um, you perceive. Sorry, sankara. Sorry, sankara. Or sankara. No, sankara. Mm -hmm. Sankara. Sanskara. Mm -hmm. Sanskara. Sanskara. Yeah, sankara. Mm -hmm. So feeling, perception, sanskara, which mm -hmm. is Sanskrit for sankara. Mm -hmm and consciousness okay these are the mental components of what we take ourselves to be so the mind has all these four attributes right and they're all separate actually although they usually arise together so this one is slightly different because feeling perception and consciousness are slightly more passive but the sankara one is actually in a way your mental reaction to things so it's the part of the mind that say first of all you have a feeling right say on the body or in the mind and you just feel it it's pleasant unpleasant or somewhere in between the next thing that happens is usually you perceive it the perception comes in so it goes ah this is a pleasant feeling right that's perception yeah and it might give it an evaluation like that's good or that's bad and then sankara reacts sankara is the part of the mind that reacts it's like i don't want this go away, you know, or you might even, that might become verbal or, or physical, you know, you shout at somebody or, or you get annoyed with yourself. And that is much more active. And this is where the Buddha says karma is made. So this is where, which has consequences, like for your own um, mental well-being and for that of others too. Because perception just alone doesn't, you know, you're not acting on it, then it's just perception, it comes and it goes. But if you react, on something then it becomes 
much more an ingrained habit. So like, okay, I perceive you as <coughs> irritating or I perceive you as attractive and I do it again and again and again. I always perceive you that way. And I, and therefore I start just always reacting in the same way to you, you know, because it starts to be ingrained. And then even if one day, I don't know, that person's not being very irritating because you always irritated in the past, you see them and immediately irritation comes on, you know, <laughs> because we condition ourselves. Yeah, it's really getting fixed to these perceptions. So I'll just read through it using uh, uh, <coughs> the. Okay, so let's think of the sankharas as a kind of mental reaction. Can we say mental reaction? Another way that uh, my teacher likes to translate it is will. So anything that um, does, in other words, the will, the will to do, react, speak. But it can be subtle too. So if something's arising in the mind, it's like the will wants to get involved and do something with it. Instead of just having aware, like sensations coming up in the body, you want to get in there and play with it and manipulate it or push it away or make it last. So that's like the mental reaction or the will. So it's a doing part of the mind. Yeah. So then the Buddha says, bhikkhus, uh, what should we call it? Let's have a vote. What do you want to call it? What makes sense? Sorry, call cool. what? Mental reaction or will or... Oh, uh, I was going to say acting out. Acting out. Okay, the active part of the mind. Mental activity? Mental reaction? Because <laughs> it's not necessarily coming to physical or, or verbal action. It's still it's at the like level of the mental mind. Mental response? Disturbance and response. I think response, yeah, it's kind of response. Okay, let's try response. Mm -hmm. Let's see how that goes. Oh, yeah, that's quite good, actually. Nice one. Huh. See, these words are very nuanced and you can bring out different aspects. Bhikkhus, response is non self. For if bhikkhus, response were self, this response would not lead to suffering and it would be possible to have it as responses. Let my response be thus, let my response not be thus. Mm -hmm. But because response is non-self, response leads to affliction or suffering. And it is not possible to have it as any response. Let my response be thus, let my response not be thus. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It works really well, actually. Mm -hmm. There's sometimes when people react because these perceptions they react in, in a way towards someone and then they realize that wasn't you know what they are so they, they usually say i'm so sorry i didn't mean to say yeah. that to you you know i just mm. went uh -huh, you know, and uh -huh. i did that but you know it's yeah bad. and in a way it's true right because mm. you didn't mean to but at that moment you couldn't help it because yeah. something in us is conditioned to respond that way yeah and mm. At that moment, there's not the awareness to break through the habit. The habits are so ingrained, you know, mm. and mm. you're just used to responding a certain way. It's very hard to change it. So I think this is a compassionate teaching because it's saying, you know, that it's in a way not our fault, right? It's a, We're a product of our conditioning. Mm. But at the same time, there's a positive message because the path that the Buddha gives is a way to recondition ourselves in a more wholesome way. Mm. Yeah, But I think it takes out all the... Um, arena of guilt it mm. takes out the rug of mm. guilt and sort of self-blame and self-criticism or criticising others you know one of the things that often helps me when I see things happen you know atrocities happening in the world and you see people doing just unspeakable things I always reflect and feel well there must be something somewhere that's happened in that person's life to have caused a great deal of pain a great deal of confusion and perhaps a lack of having any wise friends or guidance, you know, and this is why they've been able to do that, because how on earth could somebody go so much against mm -hmm. their inner humanity? We have mm -hmm. this natural tendency to be kind. It's like, um, how do you call it? Like, a, uh, it's like we have an internal sort of guide or monitor that shows us that it's good to be kind, because when we're kind, 
we experience happiness, we experience mm. uplift, and people come around us, mm. people come together. Mm. We know inside that this must be right. Mm. And these people have lost that, have lost touch with that. And from a young age, I used to feel quite strongly against things like capital punishment. And uh, someone was telling me today that they want to reintroduce that in Sri Lanka, which is incredibly disturbing to my mind. Mm. Because these people mm. need rehabilitation, you know. Mm. Something somewhere has gone terribly wrong and just punishing will not solve the problem. Mm. You know, because you punish that person, but the causes are there in all of us, actually. You know, if mm. something would go wrong in our life to that extent, who knows, maybe we're capable of the same. So I think this is a great leveller. I said in the beginning, I find this a great leveller because it shows that, you know, we're a product of our conditioning. It's not like I am intrinsically more wise and holy than anyone else just because I happened to like go to India and start to practice and became a nun. That's just absolutely irrelevant in a way. You know, it's just we're all a product of the choices we've made and we can continue to make choices. The choices aren't ultimate, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we react, we respond in ways that are conditioned, programmed and the rest. But even after that, we can still choose how we relate to that. You know? So you've done something wrong. You couldn't help it. You say, OK, I'm sorry. But then you can choose, OK, do I now go home and like, slash my wrist? <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> yeah, but it happens, right? Mm -hmm. Or do I go home and I, I, I sort of try to really review my life and think about you know, how I can start to bring a bit more kindness in my life, hang around good people, maybe read some books, mm. maybe apologise, simple things, mm. you know, you don't in have to meditation, change. you use the word realignment, which I think mm. that's a really helpful word. That's good, mm. yeah, realignment, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, because I think we have a natural sort of uh, alignment to goodness and truth. But sometimes we just stray a bit because of our habits and conditions. Because we talk yeah. about lines, don't we? Like mm. stepping over the line. Right, or, it's true. It's, you know, true. it's true. Back in line. Back in line, back on track. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Mm. And I think it also um, implies that we know when we're mm. off mm. track and, and we kind of know... Like that the alignment, being in alignment is our natural state, if you like. Like that's what, as humans, is our potential. You know, we have great potential and we are intrinsically good. Like if somebody walked out of the room now and saw, say, like a little child in a lake or in, you know, in a river and they were struggling, I mean, I think we'd probably jump in and grab that child unless we have a huge water phobia or can't swim or, you know, but you do your utmost to save that life. There was a woman I heard about on the news that was, uh, well, I think more than <coughs> one, some petitions going around about uh, some people who work for the immigration lifeguards or something i don't know what you call them but anyway they they're going in rescuing refugees who've been mm -hmm. you know who i don't know whether they've jumped overboard or uh, <coughs> tried to swim tried to get to you tried to swim in yeah and then they're going in and rescuing them and they're saying well you can threaten me with imprisonment they're actually doing that but i have to do that otherwise i lose my human nature mm -hmm. this is Human, how can you start to punish people for saving lives? I think yeah. something's gone seriously wrong if we punish people for saving lives. And I think no matter what the punishment, people will continue to do that. And that mm. is wonderful. It should give us a lot of hope, a lot of hope. Because in the end, it doesn't matter really how much... Actually, that's the other thing about this. Does it really matter whether you always feel pleasant feeling or not? Is that really so important? You can't control it anyway. But you can develop this inner goodness and the sense of purpose and meaning and you know deeper qualities that are going to grow and that are going to be there with you mm. it's something much deeper it's something beyond these transitory things i mean they're still not ours as such but we can definitely align ourselves to that instead of to these more superficial things that come and they go and the buddha says anyway they lead to affliction right because they don't stay the same. I mean, we're going to get older, we're going to get sicker. That's mm. a fact, you know. Mm. How are you going to deal with that? Mm. Mm. Yeah. So I'll just go through the very last one and then we'll have some um, opportunity to discuss it. I knew we wouldn't get through. This is still one paragraph, by the way, because there's different sections to this. Mm. But um, sometimes it's good to have the repetition. 
because it helps us get the, the gist. So the last one is consciousness, and this I think might be what you were referring to as mind. Often people refer to consciousness as mind. In this sutta, it's clearly saying that there are different aspects to mind. Feeling is one of them because it's not the body that feels. Like just material, materiality can't feel. It has to have mind there in order to feel what's happening on that base of body. Yeah, like a, this can't feel because there's no mind there to feel. So feeling is actually a mental quality. Perception is an aspect of the mind. How can you be aware without perceiving? Like as long as awareness is there, there's going to be a perception as well. And then, uh, yeah, the response part is always there too, although we can modify that. Yeah. But there will be some kind of response unless you're in very deep states of meditation, where that kind of, well, Ajahn Brahm calls it the will. It is the sense of like the thing that's watching but also interfering. <laughs> so it wants to be involved in the process. That part can be quieted be quieted down and then the consciousness and the thing with consciousness is that we sometimes think that's always there but it's actually because it happens at such speed of light apparently they say nowadays that they can see um vibrations in the speed of light or something i forget the exact piece of research so you probably have to look it up if you want to get it pro correct but it was something that the scientists once thought was so fast and so continuous that it was with one thing and now they're breaking it down into wavelets or particles, something that seemed very, you know, still and one thing. And it's the same with consciousness. Consciousness isn't actually just one thing. It's, my, it's moments of consciousness following very, very quickly after each other. Very, very, very quickly. And we can't see that because our minds are too slow. Our mindfulness isn't fast enough. So this is, it's easy enough to feel the feelings like changing, right? I don't know if anybody's had the experience where you feel like tingling or vibration and you can feel like these almost like cells moving mm -hmm. quite quickly. Mm -hmm. But then the mind's also moving even more quickly. If it wasn't, it couldn't keep up with that. It wouldn't be able to keep up with it. But it's also aware like this. So each time it's aware, that's a different moment of consciousness. Each moment is a different moment. So, but that's very hard to see unless you get very deep samadhi. Mm -hmm. So consciousness, here the Buddha says, consciousness is non-self. For if bhikkhus, consciousness were self, this consciousness would not lead to suffering and it would be possible to have it of consciousness. Let my consciousness be thus. Let my consciousness not be thus. But because consciousness is non-self, Consciousness leads to affliction, and it is not possible to have it of consciousness. Let my consciousness be thus. Let my consciousness not be thus. And I'll just read one more little paragraph, because this is again repeated with all five. Okay, so form, materiality, feeling, um, response, perception, and consciousness. So then the Buddha asks a question. What do you think, bhikkhus, is form, or is feeling, or is perception, consciousness, or response, permanent or impermanent? Then they all say, impermanent, venerable sir. Then he says, is what is impermanent, suffering or happiness? Then they say, suffering, venerable sir. Where's it gone? Uh, is what is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. What do you think? If it's impermanent, suffering, and subject to change, can we say this is who I am, this is mine, this is myself? If it is, then it's constantly disappearing. So here the Buddha's making the link between impermanence, suffering and non-self and these are the three characteristics that um, that a mind can penetrate and that lead to the insights that liberate. So these are the, basically the characteristic of everything we experience. So the reason the Buddha talks about these five is because 
there's nothing in our experience that doesn't come under one of these five. Can you think of anything that doesn't come into one of these categories? So he's trying to point out that there's no place in existence where there is actually a self. There's no place in this conditioned world where things arise and things pass that can be relied on, that can be clung to, that can be identified with as something permanent and lasting and that we can own and you know, we own it, we control it, we can do what we want with it. There's nothing like that in this material world. So the point of this is to show that these areas are the areas where we do cling and which cause suffering. And then, of course, the rest of the Buddha's teaching is to show that there's a different arena altogether where conditioned phenomena cease. Okay. So we, are, we learn to say things like, I am happy or I am of course. sad. That's, but in reality, maybe we would be better to say there is happiness yeah. at the moment right or there is suffering at the moment yeah. but not i am suffering right or, you know, right this, yeah. yeah i see now yeah yeah, yeah. you could also use the word observe i suppose couldn't you yes i observe yeah <laughs> i observe <laughs> time <laughs> suffering or whatever you can. i can there's suffering at the moment there's suffering <laughs> well, there's a lot of suffering in my heart yeah. <laughs> i mean you can't entirely avoid the word i because then you have to say i observe who observes <laughs> or you can say the suffering in my heart or the suffering arises. It can sound a bit strange, but it's not actually a strange idea because in Burma, one of the amazing things about the language is they don't use personal pronouns or any no. sorts of pronouns hardly at all. So they really? just say things like tuade, it just means going, and it's like, who's going? I just think, but what is really? it? Who's going? You're going? I'm going? I don't know. Tuade, but you just have to guess it from the context. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. So they actually think quite differently about mm. life, and I think that does mean that that sense of self is a little bit less um, mm. solidified. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's amazing, it always isn't it? It reflects the psyche, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. So. It does, yeah. Yeah, yeah it does. Just um, while I remember, I want to make one quite, I think, quite important point about this, because one of the things that this is saying is that we waste a lot of time <laughs> on trying to control these things, you know, because they're actually conditioned and they don't belong to us. And so <coughs> if we could just learn to have a bit of distance or let go a little bit more, we might have a bit less suffering around it, right? And one of the things that we can make a mistake with when we come to the spiritual path is that we feel we've got to now, okay, all right, I know that this isn't me, right? This isn't me, but I can develop a better me, you know, that me, at university or as a teenager that was sort of me but not really I can do better than that so now I'm going to be like a non and now I'm going to be like a spiritual person instead and this is actually saying that you none of it is self so why try to keep creating identities mm -hmm. the point of Buddhism mm -hmm. isn't to become a better person or to transform yourself into something different it's actually to see that you're taking something which is not self to be a self. See what I mean? We're actually misapprehending our experience. Mm. And that's where the transformation happens. It's not that we need to become something better or different. The transformation happens when we see that um, that what we think is a, is a self is actually not a self. That, that's, that's the scope I don't for think that that help day to day because well, in life intention I see as everything intention uh, yeah have, in the process if we, have we, intent, intent, if we have a positive intention then we are wanting to yeah develop, and that's very nice path, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly but the thing is when you see that there's it's conditioned then you're more likely to develop the eightfold path because you realize that nothing's fixed Therefore, you can put in different conditions to get be desired results. So if you know mm. that it's good to be kind and then somebody says, well, here's a path, you can follow that path because by putting in those conditions, you're going to be more likely to get certain mm. results. It doesn't if it was, if you were you and you were it? always going to be like that, then there'd be no point following a path. You'd mm. be predestined to be the way you are forever and ever. 
but the intention mm -hmm. can be to develop an openness and the willingness to Correct. change, can't it? Absolutely. And now, I mean. But yeah. I think what we're saying is that intention is not you, that intention mm. is conditioning. That's all. That's the only thing. It's not to say that we shouldn't have intention or we shouldn't have feelings or we shouldn't like even try to align ourselves or incline towards pleasant. We can. But what we're saying is that that's conditioned. Like our, our, even the idea that, the, that you want to practice, that didn't come from you. That came from things that you read or people that you met or, you know. Do, do you see? So we're never going to what I mean. escape conditioning Correct. I mean what we we can choose to change the condition or let the change let the conditioning go but we're always as humans going to use our minds yes of course of course of course but if yeah. you're practicing and then you're being wiser and you're being kind and you're letting go yeah is that not for the want of a better word escaping are you not that's when you haven't got that anymore Mm -hmm. Because you find that that place where just nobody's there anymore. Sorry, not no, um, I, say that again. What what's not there anymore? Again. I think I know. I, could but, I um, could I have a guess at what you might be meaning? Yeah. I wonder if you're meaning that um, when we learn to sort of observe things as kind of arising and passing, and we don't identify so much with them they tend to start to calm down, they tend to start to become less intense, less kind of, of a problem, they start to settle and the mind becomes more peaceful and at that time there's less of a sense of self. Mm, the right. sense of self yeah. starts to sort of fade a little bit. So the less Whereas, attachment, the more peacefulness. Yes. Like when we stop identifying with things so much, when we just, it's like, it's like if uh, there's a pain in my knee, like mentally, this is just a physical example. Mentally, I grab it, you know, my mind goes, oh, and it goes, oh, oh, oh. So there's this, like, tightening around it, and because of that, it gets very solid. It feels very, very solid. But then if I can just, like, get back a bit like this, you know, mentally, move my hand away a bit, and I'm not, like, identifying, I'm not so much in it and involved with it because it's not mine, so why don't I just, like, take a step back and just look at what's happening, just, like, have a look. Okay, this is nice, but this is happening. Let me just see how it goes. Then there's a softening and there's a lessening of that sort of um, sense of self. Otherwise, it's like, oh, my back, my back really hurts. I'm no good. Like, everybody else can sit. I'm not made for meditation. It just gets more and more solid. And then you leave with this yeah, really I mean, knotted up sort yeah, of sense of self. Back, yeah. But the so, mind is still making a choice. Yeah. As to how to respond to that. It is still making the, the knee, choice, that's it? right. The mind is making the, the choice. Neck. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. It just seems yeah. like it's yeah. a lot softer. Yeah. A lot softer. Mm. I know what you're getting at, and I mean, it's not a talk entirely, but the whole point of this is that if you f get the idea that there's no sense of self, just an idea in the beginning, it helps you to sort of see phenomena as phenomena and just have a bit of a distance from it so that you can understand them a bit better but the whole point of the path generally is that first of all we learn ways to calm the mind so that's through the sealer the li living of an ethical life yeah. and then oh, the yeah. training of the mind so yeah we do take that there is you know at the conventional level a mind there is a you there is a me you know at the conventional level otherwise we can't talk but so you work on that at the conventional level, but the point is to get the mind to a place where it becomes very, very still and very, very powerful. And at that point, when there's very little sense of self, you're much less invested in what you see. And at that point, you're able to have deeper insight and see that actually all of this was conditioned. The whole process was conditioned. Like... The yeah. fact that, you know, this speech led to this effect and then that led to this and then that led to that and then it led to my mind being peaceful, which led to joy arising, which led to stillness. They, each thing was conditioned by something that went before. Yeah, I, I mean, I get that. But like today, for example, I've been thinking a lot about how the mind totally controls how we choose to see things. You know, I've had a conversation mm. with a mother whose five-year-old daughter is in a very, very difficult place. Um 
and you know observing how the mother's trying with her mind to sort it out yeah and how that blocks other knowing other it does yeah you know it does yeah ways of coming through yeah, so yeah. this seems a lot of human life is very disturbed by the fact that humans want to use their minds and are not aware of all the other senses mm. and how to allow those yeah, to come that's very through true, to, actually. to very true. heal and solve something. Yes, yes, yes. And I think in the West, certainly, I think the Dalai Lama once said that Westerners, they tend to be develop their head and not their heart mm. because we're so mm. much into trying to do things mentally and trying to figure mm. things out Which mentally. is a massive stress, isn't it? Because it's yeah. like it's here. I think we do identify a lot with our minds. Mm. Yeah. With doing instead of being. Yeah, yeah, but they're, they're so in a teaching to tell humans who are totally using their mind, mm. you know what I mean, to kind mm. of we are not self not to use the mind. No, we're not it saying seems... that. We're not saying that no. at all. No. Well, we're saying that it we're saying that mind or consciousness, he doesn't use the word mind. Consciousness, how would we say? I think that would be Sankara, actually, trying to fix things. It is not self. And because it's not self, it leads to affliction. So it's not possible to have it this way or have it that way. Um, and is what is impermanent and suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded as me or mine? It's just trying to stop identifying <coughs> with it. It's not trying to change it. It's not trying to say it shouldn't be there or it's bad or something like that. It's the fact that we think that we're in control. He's saying you're not in control, so mm. stop trying so hard oh, yeah, yeah. to try and well, fix like, everything I, I and change that. everything. Yeah. Mm. It's just in the modern world, it's mm -hmm. a massive leap, isn't it, to go from where people I are using their minds no, intently. For to me, suffering. the easiest bridge is to see that, um, to be a bit softer with yourself, and rather than say, okay, well, this is how I am, just to say, well, no, that's how you are because of conditions. You know, there's been certain things in your life that have made you react that way. Therefore, there are things that you can do to change that. Mm -hmm. So you can be a lot more gentle with yourself, a lot more forgiving with yourself, and also look for different ways to be. Whereas if you thought that that was the way you are and that's that, I mean, I don't know, but I've yeah. met people who say, well, this is how I am, you won't change me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That That's, yeah. you know, there's not much scope there for, no. yeah, <laughs> for that sort of... Mm. No options are there. Yeah, no no options. Where there's no options, options, there's no openings. Yeah, right exactly. Exactly. Yeah. People yeah. usually say yeah. that kind of thing as well. It's quite an attitude, <laughs> don't they? Yeah. 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 So you, you've talked yeah. about non-self. What is self? Well, the Buddha never talked about self. He just talked about what is non-self. <laughs> <laughs> if you can tell me anything else that could possibly exist in the world, <laughs> then maybe that would be it. But I think this was pretty comprehensive. Well, you could say it's the self lasts just for a fraction of a second and doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but then he's saying, is it fit to be called a self? Not really. Is no, it really fit to be called a self? Exactly. Yeah. 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 I would say, yeah. why do we want to find a self? Yeah. I'd ask you a different question. Yeah. Does there need to be a self? Mm -hmm. yeah. Does there need yeah. to be something so we call a self? Yeah, if you're talking about non-self, Yeah. <coughs> There must be a, a, an answer or self also because, and then we are beating about the bush of, of things that we are not, but what we are. That's important also to understand, isn't it? That's not my understanding of the Buddha's teaching. I mean, I think it's important to understand the way this whole process is working. But I think what the Buddha's saying is that that isn't actually a self. There is something there, there's a process, there's a thing, there's a phenomena, yeah. but it isn't a self. And to me, that's a relief. I mean, why why does there need to be a self? Why is there need to be non-self? Well, it's not that there because needs to be Because if there is no self, self, there is no non-self also. Uh-huh. I'm not sure about that. If there is no <coughs> self, why is there non-self? The reason he's talking in terms of non-self is because that in ancient India there was a very um, deep feeling that things were self and that there was this kind of eternal self that was some kind of transcendental state, transcendent state, and that that was the higher self. And the Buddha was trying to break that belief by showing, well, look, could you call, would that be the consciousness then? 
because consciousness is changing and consciousness because it's changing leads to suffering could it be the perception then okay what could that actually be so he's trying to break that delusion because he's mm. actually been somewhere where everything ceases everything ceases beyond even paramatma or any of this higher self mm. beyond that he's been somewhere else where everything ceases Mm. That's what Nibbana means, and that's the difference mm. between Buddha's teaching yeah. and Advaita Vedanta or, mm. you know, any of those kind of philosophies. Mm. It's not that those states don't exist, it's just that that's not complete peace. Mm. They too are the conditioned, they last for a time, but then they cease. So the Buddha talked of all the different realms, the Deva realms, the Brahma realms, mm. you know, and the Brahmas believe that they're eternal, they believe that they're go on forever and ever because they live for eons mm -hmm. but the Buddha had been to those realms too and he'd seen that even those are conditioned by maybe very very good wholesome actions but eventually that too comes to an end mm -hmm. and that's why he said Nibbana is the highest peace mm -hmm. because everything ceases and it's very hard for us to understand who, who, who reach Nibbana? sorry what, who reach <laughs> Nibbana? Oh. what does reach that? Why it nothing oh, <laughs> <laughs> so we are nothing then <laughs> I mean, all of these questions the Buddha wouldn't really discuss because the thing is they come from a sense of self. The questioning comes from an idea that there needs to be a self there. Yes. Whereas actually, maybe there doesn't. We're only thinking in terms of a paradigm of self because that's all we know. So he didn't really mm -hmm. want to talk about that. He just wanted us to examine the places where we think there's a self to find out if really there is or not. Mm -hmm. And through doing that, on this path you notice that the more you examine the more peaceful you become mm -hmm. and it's like okay so i thought that i need my body always to be here to meditate but actually when it starts to fade away it's more peaceful so maybe i can let go a bit more and then i can let it fade a bit more okay now the really body's disappearing and then bits of the mind start disappearing you think oh okay well i thought i needed that part of the mind because otherwise i'd feel lost but actually it's quite nice when it disappears so maybe because of that i could let go a bit more <laughs> And then it just keeps going like that. And I mean, mm. unless you've actually experienced those states, I don't think we can really talk about it because mm. even if you have, I mean, people will never talk about it in those mm. terms of self mm. or non-self or anything because it's, mm. it's, it's different from that. It's not the realm of self or non-self. Mm. It's different from all of that. It's, uh, it's a different thing. We, we are using the word I, I every time. Yeah, I know. And then we are saying non-self, non-self. I know, I know, I know. The I, that is a question, uh, really. The non-self we can understand mm. uh, because we can uh, observe them. Uh, can you really? No, but the, the suffering, you can, the, the, mm. the effect, isn't it? Mm. So there is non permanence of suffering or, or even Yeah, but the happiness is impermanent joy. too. So the, who is the one who enjoy or who, who, who suffer or... Suffering, mm, yeah. suffering. Mm. Yeah. Suffering, suffering. It's a crash. Yeah, there must be something. <laughs> well, this is the because delusion. Because the body can't suffer. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, no. I mean, this is what we think, but the Buddha's just asking us to explore those. I think rather no, no, than I'm explore... I know, I know, but the thing is that rather than explore the areas that we don't know, let's mm. explore the areas we know, right? Because otherwise it's just a philosophy. Now we're going into philosophy. Like, mm. if you're saying, well, what is that self? The way you can find out is by looking at the areas which are not, because mm -hmm. these are your immediate experience. These five you can immediately experience. So look at those and see if there's anything there that could be a self. If you can deduct all of that, then see what's left. Mm -hmm. Then see what's left. The but the thing is, most experiences, if not every experience you can possibly have, comes in those five. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's the only way you can begin. You can't begin from something that you don't experience. Yeah, but it's been begun 5,000 years ago. <laughs> it's still beginning. Sorry. <laughs> it's uh, the the thing is about five thousand years ago the idea, and the, what was the, the, the idea of non-self of oh, what suffering okay. is when Buddha Buddha started it is it? Well, the previous Buddhas too. Mm -hmm. Anybody who becomes a Buddha sees that these mm -hmm. areas yeah, yeah. are conditioned and that cease. Yeah, yeah. They cease. So the I got yeah. I got one question. Yeah. How do you deal with illness? Mm -hmm. Now, for example, in, in the last month, there are lots of cases in Pakistan where people with um, uh, the people with uh, uh, autism mm -hmm. is quite quite disturbed. They need a lot of care, mm -hmm. and they are being taken over by um, by the 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just took a photo at home to treat this through my pancreas. Yeah. For example, put into the wounds without any kind of stimulation, and uh, they are fed through the door. Or, I mean, really, yeah, okay. really terrible. Mm-hmm. Say you are the mother yeah. or the father of this child. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How can you be at peace? How can you not be angry? How can you not be frustrated? How, how to be, yes, at peace, yeah. harmony with yourself yeah. when you see your child suffering? Yeah. How? I think whatever kind of suffering happens in the outside world, we suffer not because of the outside, but because of how that makes us feel inside. Yes. So yes. the only way we can deal with anything like this is to work on the things which are coming up within ourselves. So the thought that, you know, oh, my child's being treated like this, the feeling that that gives you in the body, you know, the anger that arises because of that, we have to learn to find ways to meet it and to give it kindness and to understand, okay, this is there. First of all, how can I accept it? How can I meet it with compassion? But then also, how can I understand that it is arising and it is also passing? This is not going to be permanent. And if I can learn to like meet this with wisdom, it has a chance to settle down a little bit, just a little bit, so that then yes. I know what how to be in the world. Because if I'm overwhelmed by that, then I can't be of any help to my child. Mm-hmm. So with anything that happens in the outside, I mean, there's so many different kinds of suffering. We have to find a way to make peace with our inner experience in order to be of any use and to be able to find some peace, enough to try to act. It's not to step away completely, but you need to be able to breathe, peace, but find some peace. Somehow you have then to fight, fight with the thoughts to to get... Well, I don't like the word fight, really, because I think it doesn't really work. If you go in with an attitude of fighting, then how can we understand each other? I think we have to be open enough to say, okay, what's happening here, you know, what's happening? I don't agree with this, write a petition. But if we're angry, it doesn't have any more, it doesn't give any extra good effect than just being active without anger. And well, it doesn't really it, it is, it is, help. It does make, um, it, it makes us very hard to think clearly. It is clearly, you see, I only can do weather reports. And yeah, it sounds similar to what um, Liz was talking about with this other mother uh, that she spoke about earlier, that you're just dealing with something here rather than the sorting out that energy and opening it up to see yeah. or, or what's what going on. If you have to so. say the term with the loving relative. The only way I think that we can deal with anything in life is to practice. Because if we haven't practiced with the easier things, how are we going to practice with the difficult things? Of course it's a mystery, we don't know. But all I know is that if I practice a little bit every day and, and, you know, try to learn to open my heart even to very difficult inner experiences, then perhaps when these things happen, really difficult things happen, then I'll have some practice at how to face Mm -hmm. them, yeah. Some wisdom also, especially that they are changing and that there's certain things I can do mentally to worsen the effect or to alleviate the effect. So, for example, I have a thought of, oh, this is so terrible that this is happening. I can then try to sort of say, I would actually get into the body then, see how does it feel in the body, where can I locate it in the body, and try and be present Mm. with it, and try to stop spinning out. But another way is to just go on and on with that line of thought, and and you'll find that you just get yourself more and more and more upset. So when you start to see that you do have a choice to some extent as to whether you roll in it and allow the mind to go off and all kinds of negative thought, or you have a choice to just try to stop, try to be present, try to breathe, you know, then you have a little bit of influence over that. You can, you feel the suffering, but you don't let it, you don't let it, um, what do you say, proliferate. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just trying to put myself in the position of the... Yeah, but I don't know if it's very helpful, because when you put yourself in that position, how do you feel? You probably feel angry. I'll feel sick. Yeah, yeah. But I also have a very but you close might, friend you who, might. Was, mm, who does the opposite, and she cares very beautifully for autistic children. She's mm. a teacher, and she's a 
to work once the tree goes. Mm -hmm. So in that, I, I know there's something else going on. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Basis. And you know that you might you might have that response if any, anything like this ever happens to us. I mean, I always think, what happens when my teacher dies? I won't cope. You know, I won't cope. I'll lose my best friend. I'll lose my teacher. I'll lose my colleague. I'll lose my dumber father and my brother. And <laughs> you know, how am I going to cope? Who am I going to phone every time I need a chat? You know, that's who I phone. But when it happens, who knows? I mean, I may decide that okay, what would he say? You know, maybe maybe my teacher's living in me. Maybe there's some of those mm. qualities that have been transmitted that are going to come out at that time. Yeah. We don't know. Mm. You know, that's just one example. But I know I don't know, really. I, I know there's going to be grief, but I also don't know what kind of qualities are going to come through for me at that mm. time. Because I am going to connect to his goodness and what he, he taught me. That's for sure. It's in there, you know. It's in there deeply. And, and if you were in that situation, it was your child. I mean, it's very theoretical because it's not going to happen to you, is it? So in a way, you're winding yourself up a bit. No, 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 no. But, but can I just I say, you don't know in that situation like what would come through. It mm. may be that there'll be anger, but you may also feel really fiercely compassionate. You, know, you may feel like, I have to help. And that might be enough energy and focus that your mind goes that way more strongly than the other way. You, know? you just, you just hang on the positive. Mm. I was going to say that Sometimes if we feel strongly about something, I, you know, I was thinking about the woman who used to come to our group, doesn't so much now, I hardly yeah. know, but I felt really passionately about homeless people and went off yeah. to work with them. Yeah, yeah. So she right. does a lot of work with homeless yeah. people yeah. because yeah. that's where she's made to go. So if we're looking at something external that really bothers us, <clears throat> we might decide to take action Good. to help that particular group yeah. of people. Mm. And then Volunteer. there's no room for anger because yeah. we know we're doing something. Because I think anger, when we observe something externally, it kind of disturbs us when we're not when we feel we're not doing anything. Yeah, the helplessness. You know, yeah. Yeah. definitely. You know, definitely. it's not a good feeling. Is that's it? a really good point, actually. I think that's right because anger is an energy, and there's a goodness mm. to it because you don't want to see that. You don't want that injustice. Right. It hurts you. You know, not and there's hurt. It. It's yeah, very, yeah. very painful, but then it, it is an energy, so that is in you, and the, there is a reason for that, because you know what's right and what's wrong. So perhaps you can put that energy onto bringing more goodness, countering that balance. It's just, I don't want to go into it further, because I, we need to stop now, but it's just a thought to share, because mm. I think that's a really, really good point. But I would like to wind up, because I also need to get back and have some rest. And uh, I think, isn't it customary that you may have a cup of tea? I don't know yes. how long uh, how long you have, but yes, I will need to go for the evening. So thank you very thank much. You very much. Thank, thank you very, very much. And I know the teaching, this kind of teaching is a bit maybe challenging, maybe confusing, but it is meant to be. And it's any kind of inquiry is good. We don't have to have the answers, but to inquire, to ask the question is a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. And we find what makes sense to us. You know, this makes sense to me, but only at certain points, you know, only up to a certain point, there's still clinging to various things that, you know, I identify with. Exactly. The don't know mind. The don't know mind, yeah.